So what's the problem with nice guys, Robert? May not be a problem with nice guys. Probably a lot of nice guys are probably just fine. Um, but of course, we're addressing the, the, the nice guy that I talk about in my book, No More Mr. Nice Guy. And I, I actually lead in that book because, you know, I, 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 I'm a recovering nice guy. You know, if you'd met me 35 years ago, I probably would have told you uh, I'm a nice guy. You know, and I, I, I would have thought, why doesn't everybody try to live like that? And, um, and I thought that would, you know, make people like me, love me. I'd get what I, I wanted in life. I'd have a good life. I, uh, I'd treat other people well and they'd treat me well in return. And, um, Fortunately, I, I fell into the situations where I had to go take a look at that roadmap, that, that meme that, oh, if I'm just a good guy, I'll be liked and loved and get my needs met and have a nice free, problem-free smooth world. And I began realizing that I was often anything but nice. Uh, I, I wasn't authentic. I wasn't the real me. I wasn't telling the truth. I would leave out stuff. I, I, I talk about the, the lie coach that I had in my head that would teach, you know, tell it this way, leave that part out. No, don't tell that. Distract them from that. You know, just, just constantly telling me in my head how not to tell the truth. Right. And, and mainly because I didn't want anybody upset it with, with me. I didn't want to rock the boat. I didn't want to hurt anybody. Um, I, I say no more Mr. Nice Guy, that nice guys are, uh, nice guys hate two kinds of feelings, their own and everybody else's. <laughs> um, feelings just make us really uncomfortable. We think if we're having strong feelings, uh, we're doing something wrong. We're going to get in trouble. And if anybody else is having strong feelings, we must have done something wrong. We're in trouble. And and so while, you know, the men I work with that identify as nice guys are are, are good men. I mean, often we're trying to live good lives and, and treat people well. But we've got this paradigm. And, and basically, it's built around toxic shame and anxiety. The toxic shame is an internalized emotional belief. I'm not okay. There's something wrong with me. I'm not okay just as I am. I'm unlovable. It can be tied to things we do, but it's usually tied to our core self. And we may be conscious of it. We may not be. The other part of that is the anxiety of, of our, our, our discomfort of, um, of failure, of looking foolish, of people being upset at us, uh, uh, of just, you know, fear of the unknown. So this anxiety and this shame tends to drive nice guys to do two things. One is to try to become what we think other people want us to be, to be liked and loved and get our needs met. So we're chameleons, we're liars, we're, we, you know, we're, we're not our true self. The second thing that we're doing is we try to hide anything about ourselves that might get a negative reaction. Uh, and that's usually our, our thoughts, our feelings, our opinions, and our sexuality. So, so for example, if you and I were having a conversation and as a nice guy, it's important for me to have your approval. I would be, you know, watching you carefully, censoring what I said and did. If you nodded at something, I go, okay, that was good. He nodded. All right. That was good. I'll do more of that. And then if like you kind of squinted or kind of drew back or had a questioning look, I go, oh, okay. I better clarify that. I better say that in a different way. So, you know, he, has, he approves or I better not bring that one up again. And that's how nice guys are all the time. Right. They've got that, you know, again, that coach in their head. Say it that way. No, don't say it that way. Uh oh, you might have said that one wrong. Uh oh, don't do it that way or don't let them know that. And that's going on all the time. And, you know, I, I call that just that 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 committee in our head constantly, you know, it's made up of our parents, our, our church, our culture, of women, of, you know, everybody. Lit, we're listening to all those voices. I better be this way, better not be that way. So, again, the main thing that's wrong with nice guys is not that, that, we're, we're bad people or there's anything wrong with us as people is that we're not ourselves. We're not our true selves. We're not authentic. We're not what I call integrated. We, we're not, we don't, we don't, we don't look at all aspects of ourselves, and we surely don't let anybody else see all aspects of ourselves. And honestly, probably most people on the planet are doing that to some degree. We all just do it in our own new, unique ways. And nice guys tend to do it with that seeking approval and validation and avoiding conflict and keeping the peace and things like that. So there, there's, there's, to try to answer your question, what's wrong with nice guys? Um, basically, we're, we're not our true selves. We're not authentic. Well, you mentioned some of the maladies of being a nice guy. If you want, yeah. if you want to resolve some of those maladies and treat them, is the treatment being a bad Just go guy? the other way, yeah, 180 yeah, yeah. degrees the other way. Uh, you know, that's, that's what a lot of people, you know, think 
make sense. Well, you know, if this doesn't work, let's just swing the pendulum the other way. You know, patriarchy doesn't work. Let's just swing the pendulum the other way. You know, whatever. You know, what if this doesn't work, let's just go to the other extreme. And what what I believe is that, you know, you know, the the, the title of No More Mr. Nice Guy is a little bit of a paradoxical title because, you know, probably we've all said that at some point. No more Mr. Nice Guy. I'm not putting up with this anymore. But, you know, when you see that on the, on the book cover, you think, why would somebody write a book teaching men to be not nice? There's already enough not nice <laughs> men out there. And so people pick the book up and, and, you know, understandably think, well, if it's no more Mr. Nice Guy, he must be teaching guys how to be assholes. But one of the things that, that I often say is 180 degrees from crazy is still crazy. And people have a hard time understanding that. And I actually I got that from 12-step programs. And they've, they've got a lot of clever sayings like that. But if, if, you know, if, for example, the nice guy is trying to be different from his father, and that's how he's trying to be as a man, maybe different from how his mother projected men or different than all the bad men they've heard women complain about. Okay. If he's trying to be different from that, doing 180 degrees the other direction, well, that's crazy. You know, uh, he's not him. He's trying to, his, his standard is, will be different than this thing over here that maybe some people didn't like or complained about, but who's to even say that was wrong or bad? Okay, well, let's say then, oh, well, I, I, I'm being a nice guy. Well, I'll be 180 degrees different from that. Well, that's still crazy, right? It, it's not going to really solve you. Being authentic is, is an answer. And again, that, that may take a lifetime of work to, to actually come to understand what it means to be authentic. But what I believe is let's just compare, for example, we got the nice guy over here, we got the, the asshole jerk over here. This guy lets everybody walk on him, this guy walks on everybody. And we might think, uh, guys will say, well, I, I know I don't want to be the nice guy, but I don't want to be an asshole. I need to find, you know, someplace in the middle, because that's how we think. So if it's not this extreme, and it's not that extreme, it must be this. And I tell guys, I don't know what the tipping point is between two toxic extremes. There isn't one. We're going to have to actually come up another level, not just find something in between. And, and because I think the nice guy and the asshole jerk, the, the not so nice guy are both driven by shame and anxiety. It's just that the nice guy manages, they're both in what was called fight, flight, freeze response. It's that sympathetic nervous system of like we're under attack. We have to do something. We have to, we're in survival mode. The nice guy is in the flee and freeze. And sometimes we'll add fawn to that, you know, the whole, trying to make it better, get approval. And so they're managing shame and anxiety by, by hiding, freezing, fleeing, running away from conflict, just staying out of, out of harm's way. Whereas what we call the, the asshole jerk or what I call the asshole jerk over here, they're also trying to manage their shame, their toxic shame. I'm not good enough. I'm not lovable. Um, I'm not okay just as I am, and their anxiety, but they do it by fighting, being overtly aggressive. Nice guy is covertly aggressive, passive aggressive, indirect with their angers or feelings. So I think they're both on the same level. They're both trying to manage shame and anxiety in dysfunctional ways from that, that sympathetic nervous system. So finding someplace in the middle of that doesn't solve the problem. So I believe if men can learn to start, call, differentiate, ask themselves, what do I want? What feels right to me? What's important? What's true to me? And then follow that through life. If they can self-soothe their anxiety, if they can find safe places to release their toxic shame and get a more accurate view of themselves, where they can actually befriend their shame, befriend their dark emotions like anger, sadness, rage, to befriend their shadow, every aspect of their sexuality, when we can do that up here at this level, that makes us real. It makes us authentic. When we can take these things about ourselves we don't like and don't, don't ever look at and the things about ourselves that we do want to present to the world and integrate those together and get equally comfortable with all aspects of that, that's an authentic person. That's an integrated man. And um, maybe just paradoxically, that's also a very attractive man. That's the kind of man that, that the world is going to be naturally drawn to because he is integrated. He is what you see is what you get. There is nothing hidden, nothing half-assed. And the world is drawn to, to that kind of person because we don't see it 
very often. Usually we see the nice guy wimp, the asshole jerk, or something in between that's still not particularly interesting or attractive. That's super interesting, Robert. A line in your book that I really enjoyed, and it took me a minute to digest and interpret into my own life, was becoming a nice guy is a way of coping with situations where it does not feel safe or acceptable for a boy or man to be just who he is. I want to understand how being a nice guy is somewhat a coping mechanism. What what would they be coping against? What they're coping against, and and really that that belief that 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 you're not okay just as you are. Right? There's something fundamentally wrong that needs to be changed, hidden, overcome. That's toxic shame. That's the belief I'm not okay just as I am. Now I know toxic shame. Um, it was a challenging concept for me to grasp both as a concept and as to where it was inside of me. And, and I've often told the story that early in my marriage to my second wife, she was a, a, a self-help junkie, therapy junkie. She loved going to therapy. Uh, she, she probably to this day probably still goes to therapy all the time. Um, and, but, but the good news was she got me into therapy and got me reading like self-help books. But, but I, re- I remember we were, we were lying in bed one evening and she was reading Healing the Shame that Binds You by John Bradshaw. And she goes, oh, 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 this is you. This is you. I go, what? And, and she reads it to me. And it's about shame. And I remember going, I, 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 I don't see that in me. And I, I don't even know if I understand that as a concept. Now, understand, I already had a PhD in marriage and family therapy. So I'd already been to a lot of school. I'm not dumb. You know, I'm, I, I managed close to a you know, four-point grade point average through all of grad school. So I'm, I'm not a dumb person. But it's like, I don't get it. And I thought, well, that kind of describes you. You don't like yourself. You know, you've never liked yourself. You always wished you were different than what you were. And you're always, you know, you've got a, a critic in your head that, you know, is always attacking you. I go, I don't have that. So that was my introduction to shame. Now, people will, will often tell me after reading No More Mr. Nice Guy, they'll say, Robert, thank you for your description of shame. I really got a clear understanding of it. Well, I think, well, that's good because I didn't. <laughs> so that must mean I, maybe I came to understand it. But what happens, where the shame comes from, is, is that every, every person walking the planet has some internalized toxic shame. It's the, the emotional belief, I'm not okay just as I am. Now, where that comes from is that when we're born, we're all completely needy, dependent, vulnerable. We're dependent and needy on our caregivers, mother, father, other caregivers. And so anything in which our needs are not met in a timely or consistent way, a child as a narcissistic being internalizes, I'm the cause of that. And that's just the way children are. We're very hip, we're in a hypnotic state. We just internalize everything at an emotional level. It'd be like, you know, if you go to a, a stage hypnotist and they hypnotize you and they give you a signal and you quack like a duck, right? Children are just internalizing that kind of, I, I must be evil. I must be terrible. But these aren't thoughts. They're emotional belief systems that get internalized deep into our core sense of self. So, and there's something going on out in front of my house that really not loud noise that I think it's somebody walking by with a leaf blower or something. <laughs> anyway, I'm sitting there going, man, I wish that would stop sometime soon. <laughs> so as that goes on behind me and I talk about shame, you know, when you feel uncomfortable like that, what is that? Huh? Children, when we feel uncomfortable, we're hungry and nobody feeds us. We're, we're cold and nobody wraps us up. Uh, we mess in our diaper and nobody changes us. We, uh, uh, we have stomach ache and nobody burps us. For the child, that feels life-threatening. It feels like I could die. And then the child then emotionally, not intellectually, the reasoning part of our brain, the prefrontal cortex, doesn't even start developing till we're approaching maybe two years old and doesn't finish developing in men till about 25 years old. But the part of our brain that is working is down here on the brain stem, way down here, if this is the brain and stem down, you know, it's a primitive part of our brain. And, and the, the amygdala manages fight, flight, freeze. It manages heart rate and respiration. It's all about survival. The theory is it also stores up emotional belief. So not picture belief, not word belief, not reasoning belief, just emotional belief. 
I'm going to die. That's an emotional belief that triggers the system. I'm bad. That's an emotional belief. Now, there's no words to go with it. It's purely nervous system wiring. It's machine language. It's what's operating underneath the apps that run on top of here in the thinking part of the brain. So everybody internalizes that. And, every, and everybody internalizes toxic shame. I'm the cause. If something bad is happening to me, I cause that. It's very grandiose. We also internalize, nice guys especially internalize, an equally grandiose belief. If I'm bad enough to cause that, I must be good enough to, to not cause it or to resolve it or fix it. That's where the trying to do the things that won't get anybody to react negatively or get their mm. approval or get their life or love has come from. So every child is experiencing these painful, uncomfortable feelings, internalizing at an emotional level. Um, I'm, I'm bad, I'm unlovable, but take the words out of it. It's just a feeling state. Their anxiety states are triggered. And every child tries to do two things. One is to manage those uncomfortable feelings right now. Some babies cry, some babies eat, some babies sleep, some babies throw tantrums, some babies, you know, smile a lot some babies frown a lot like like I, suck their thumb uh, like out of i sucked my thumb till i was in kindergarten so i guess i had some uncomfortable feelings that i was trying to manage that's just one way doing that so we all do that everybody does it the second thing that every baby does is using a very primitive brain you know brain that's evolved about as much as a lizard of trying to figure out how to prevent these uncomfortable things from happening again Right. So again, no reasoning to go with it, purely just emotional reaction. Just, you know, this, I did this, this happened without thinking. Right. Just, it's just, uh, uh, what was the term for it in psychology? My, my mind gone blank. Stimulus and response. Right. So when you and I were two weeks old, two months old, two years old, we developed these two patterns. What can I do right now to make me not feel bad? What can I do to make these things that cause me to feel bad not happen again in the future? And so every child develops what's called neuroses. Neuroses is our ways of coping with these discomforts and the, and the, the struggles of being alive using our primitive brain. So the nice guy, well, you know, well, if I smile a lot, if I have no needs, if I'm never a moment's problem, if I'm different from my father, if I'm different from my siblings, if, I, if I'm there for mother when she's sad, all, the nice guy starts doing all of these kinds of things, but they're neurotic. Neurotic meaning they, they might have served some purpose when we were these, you know, underdeveloped, helpless little beings, but we carry them with us into adolescence. They get solidified. We bring them into adulthood. They become our roadmap, our paradigm, our meme for living in the world. They represent our occurring world. They define who I am and how the world works. And everybody does this. And for the majority of us, it's fucked up. They don't work. They're called, that's why they call them neuroses, uh, is that they, if they actually worked, you know, we'd, we, we'd be happy and healthy and, and, you know, and just accepting what came in life and doing what we could and accepting the rest. But our, our need for control, our need for constant approval, our avoidance of pain, our, our addictions, all of that fit into that neurosis category. They seemingly helped us survive when we were young, but really all they do is make life harder as adults. If I reflect on some of the needs that a baby would have, they're very accustomed to the Maslow hierarchy of needs. They need sleep, they need fed, they need uh, play. And that's um, very primal, very instinctual needs. But as we grow into teens and men, our needs become elective and selective. Um, we need to essentially create environments and situations that are sometimes constructed um, selfishly. Um, that th they aren't as primal as eat, sleep, sex. Right. Do you think men struggle to create those needs or communicate those needs, if not create them, um, because they're selective and elective and out of choice and out of passion and out of pleasure, opposed to just out of survival? That's a really good question. And, and you know, probably we're, 
just to think out loud with you, we're running into a couple of things here. You know, if we take like Maslow's and there's other people that have constructed these kind of hierarchical needs. As long as we're caught up in the anxiety states, the life and death of getting those basic needs met down at the bottom of the hierarchy, the, the, the upper needs never even enter consciousness, right? So our, our primitive ancestors that were hunter gatherers, you know, basically, as long as they, you know, had enough food to eat, you know, were, weren't freezing, you know, could fuck occasionally, <laughs> was, you know, that was about it, you know, and, and, and that was pretty basic. And, you know, anthropologists say that our ancestors actually probably had a lot less stress than we do, right? And maybe had more content lives than we do. Because they were just getting the basic needs met. You know, they didn't know there was anything above that stack of needs. Well, well even, now, e even recently, I interviewed a guy called Hamilton Souther, um, who was, I think, the world's first Western shaman. Um, and he was made a master shaman in Peru in a remote um, village in the Amazon. And they didn't have a word for depression or anxiety. They had meager provisions, but everyone... He noticed in comparison to the US were way more fulfilled and happier. And it's because they never had any comparators. Um, yeah. They didn't even have language to curtail and describe some of these symptoms that people in the West were feeling. And yeah. that was only a few years ago, never mind like hundreds of years ago, as you describe. Yeah. And if we talk about most of human existence, you know, million and a half years or so, whatever number you want to pick around that. So as long as, you know, this is all we have, maybe the first three or four or five, you know, maybe out of 10, you know, uh, hierarchy in the needs. You know, if you don't know there's anything above that, life's pretty content. My, my, my pit bull Nala is lying right here at my feet, <laughs> right? She is as content as she can be. She never has to, like, get up and do podcasts, doesn't have to see clients, doesn't have to pay bills. And, you know, she, this morning, she already went, went for the walk in the park and chased balls and saw another one of her, her female friends in the park in front of the house. So she got to play with her, her another dog friend of hers. Um, and, you know, she gets to lie here on a carpet at my feet while I pay the bills. And, uh, you know, after I get done with this interview, I'll go give her a bowl of food and, you know, she'll, she'll be happy with her bowl of food and she'll relax the rest of the day. At some point in the day, she'll find a toy to tear apart and bring it to me to tussle with her. Then she'll go to sleep in her soft bed up in my bedroom and, you know, she'll snore and have a good night's sleep. So she doesn't know there's anything up here. She can't have existential angst. Now she does have enough emotional states. Um, my wife left yesterday to take a, a trip to, to go to a salsa convention in Playa del Carmen, Mexico. And my dog misses her. I'm going to leave Monday to go to Seattle for three weeks and then my wife's going to join me. So we'll be gone for three weeks. She'll still be here with, with my two stepkids. They're 16 and 18. She'll be taken good care of. But she has enough hierarchy to miss us, but not enough to know when we're coming back, if we're coming back. Is this the last time she's ever seen us? She doesn't know. She can't know. So she's in that limbo state of having some existential angst but not all the stuff. She doesn't know she's going to die. She doesn't know I'm going to die. I know I'm going to die. I know she's going to die. That brings in a whole nother mix up here, right? I know what my uh, potentials are in life, or I may know that I have more potential that I've even looked at. That causes me some angst. I know that war happens, that pandemics happen. Um, all of that you know, is in the, those higher levels that if we're just down here, they don't enter in. So, I mean, we, we could probably, you know, explore this for a long time. But, you know, I think, for example, we may even have people trying to get these needs met up here, but haven't done that great a job of getting these needs met, which leaves them in a state of anxiety. Or we have people going, well, I know I should be up here, but I have no idea how to get there, or what to do while I'm up there. So I'll just stay here because I know that, I understand that. But there's a part of me knows something is there. See, we still have the knowing, that hasn't gone away. We're just not in that space of actually maybe making choices, asking ourselves, what do I want? What feels right to me? What legacy do I want to leave in this world? How do I wanna treat people? How do I wanna be treated? 
Uh, how do I want to love? How do I how 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 do I explore myself as a spiritual being? You know, what's beyond this? Um, many of us, that's those are like we don't have ready answers, so we just stay down here. But we still know all that's up there, and I think I think that leads to probably a lot of you know. Is it, again, we could go at this from a lot of ways. Are we just happier living down here? I'm just getting basic needs met. But I think if we know there's this up here, uh uh-uh, we're not. If we don't know this is up here, like my dog or those people in the tribes, yeah, that's probably not a bad way to live. Okay, But once we know there's this up here, and that introduces existential angst into the equation of being human, this doesn't seem to be enough. But most of us have not been led or given good support to go negotiate this stuff up here. And that's where we get like our societal rules, our family rules, rules of religion, you know, all these things said, do it this way, do it this way. Don't, don't, don't dwell too much in existential angst. Just follow these rules, which is still kind of just, is that's still lower stuff. You know, the rule following stuff, that's what four and five-year-olds do. I mean, four and five-year-olds are really easy to manage. All you got to do is write down a few rules, put them on the refrigerator, tell them what the rules are, and now they're they're like, that's law. You got to follow the rules. They're on the refrigerator. You know, so it's easy to manage rule-bound people. But again, that's not, this is not the territory of rules, right? Rules are, are very basic. And so living up here means, how do I make my own rules? How do I understand what's bigger than me? What's beyond me? What's after me? What was before me? You know, what? why I'm here? Oh, that stuff gets a little bit shaky. I think I'll go smoke another joint. I think I'll watch some more porn. I think I'll binge a little bit more on Netflix. You know, I think I'll go eat some more junk food because that stuff up there, no, I'd rather just keep it down here. So again, there's probably a lot of ways that we could, you know, come at this whole thing of, you know, where are we consciously living at on that, you know, maybe one to 10 kind of scale? I have such a tension when it comes to walking the well-trodden path. Yes, it's a conventional route to, um, it's a conventional path and it's safe and it's secure and it's sensible, but the well-trodden path always leads to the same place. It doesn't, all, it doesn't always mean that it's the better route for you but as a sensible and secure way. Um, I really believe that conventional actions create conventional people, but sometimes unconventional actions create unconventional people. And for me, I have this frame of the rock and chair cinema. Uh, and I believe when I'm 80 or 90 and I'm old and more decrepit, I'll be sitting in a cinema, I'll be sitting in a rock and chair and all I have is my rock and chair cinema. And it's not a projector, it's not a TV screen, it's my own memories. I'll be trying to keep myself company with the memories that I have, um, the, I, I, I got, I got some, I got some bad news for you. What? By the time you get up to 80 or 90, your memory sucks. And mem- your memory sucks. And you memories change have... every time you revisit them, don't they? Well, they, they do. That's a whole other subject. Yeah. You know, you know, n- neuroscientists will basically say memory is, is inherently flawed. Um, because number one, we don't record memory like on a video. Um, and, and we record it based on our, our perceptions in the moment, our anxiety states, our, our paradigms. And then again, every time you revisit a memory, you alter, you change it. And every time you bring it up from consciousness, it's like right now you and I are recording over the internet and I'm uploading a, pa- a bunch of little packets of ones and zeros. You're uploading a bunch of little packets of ones and zeros. Those ones and zeros may actually not all go down the same electronic pathways. So, you know, my, some of mine might go to an Elon Musk satellite up there. Others might go to some other internet provider. Some go over there and then they all end up together again at some place and they unfold as this video. Okay. Memories like that too. It gets stored in different parts of the brain. It's stored up in little packets. Have you ever had the situation you knew a memory you had was a completely accurate, but you actually combined it with another memory you had and, and, conflated the two into one, but you were sure it happened. No, actually it was made up of part because it was little packets that got put together 
incorrectly in our mind. So yeah, memory is a whole nother thing. But yeah, just get you back to when you're 80 or 90. I'm only 68, <laughs> but I can already tell you the more um, the more neural space your memories take up in your brain, the more your brain not only stores them inaccurately, remembers them inaccurately, the more it just starts pairing them back and getting rid of them just because it only really needs the most important ones to help you survive day by day. And it doesn't want to clutter your brain with every memory. And the older you get, the more your, your brain, you know, without asking you, will just keep taking a vacuum cleaner to your <laughs> memories and just sucking them away till you don't even remember that you had that memory again. My son, like, is 39. He'll go, Dad, you remember when you did blah, blah, blah? And I'll go, no, but apparently made an impact on you as a 12-year-old. But here I am now. I don't even have a memory that that <laughs> Well, perhaps the, the, the details of the memories will change time and time as I tell them and recount them. But when I'm 80, I, I hope the large themes are exciting to revisit. Like the one time I interviewed Dr. Robert Glover on the podcast when I was in my mid-20s or I visited Jimmy Carr in London to record a podcast. I really want to create a life that in retrospect I'm glad I lived and that I'd be proud of sharing, I'd be proud of sharing the memories to my grandkids and my children. Uh, opposed to taking the well-trodden path, the sensible path, the, the the job in accounts or the job in law that's not exciting, has little novelty and little intensity. Um, I, I think I heard it on Chris Williamson's podcast that memories are stored on to facets which are novelty and intensity. So I can imagine if your son spoke about um, your first marriage or spoke about um, the first football game that you went to together, that would be a very distinct memory for you to recount opposed to the one time you went to the supermarket and he dropped grapes and you shouted at him and you can't really remember that. Um, I can imagine it's the big novel and intense experiences that you can recount. Yeah, I probably, I probably remember the grape one. You know, <laughs> but here's the thing. I, I, I love your path. You know, I, mean, I, I, think, I think it's great in your 20s, you're choosing to live a life that doesn't just, I, one, one, I, I say a lot of, I have a lot of mantras and a lot of little Gloverisms and sayings, but one of mine is he who dies with the, with the best stories wins or the most <laughs> stories. Wins. And, and I, as you can tell, I, I like to, I like storytelling. I like telling stories. And I even tell stories about my shame, about how I've been unfaithful. I'll tell stories about how I've almost died and how I was in, you know, unbearable pain for periods of time. So it's all good stories if we'll approach it that way. It's not just, you know, who, who the biggest name you got to come on your podcast. Because like you, you mentioned Chris Williamson. I remember when I first time I've been on Chris Williamson twice. And I remember the first time, you know, I kept hearing his name. People said, Robert, you should get on Chris Williamson. You should get on Modern Widows. I don't know who that is. I don't listen to podcasts. And then I realized, oh, I, he's on my schedule Friday. I've already booked with him. Yeah, you know, I, 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 got, you know, I get enough requests that you're a lot. I actually don't really check most people out before I do an interview with them. And so um, then people say, well, yeah, he was this and he's got this many followers and blah, blah. And, and, you know, so I got on, just did an interview with him like I'm doing with you and, you know, had a good connection with him and enjoyed it. And then got a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of people contacted me afterwards and I was in Texas a couple months, two, three months ago. So he and I did another one live and people keep contacting me. Everything that we think is going to be monumental for us. So like, you know, first time I got in Chris Williamson, one thing, well, I still got Joe Rogan or, you know, Tim Ferriss, you know, Marcus Aubrey or, you know, who, you know, and then at some point it's kind of like you, you, you keep rising up. And so those big milestones, even though they're important, after a while, just kind of fade into to the rest of them. So, so the point is, I think, I think we need to keep challenging ourselves, living at our edge, you know, you know, challenging myself to get on podcasts with people. Oh, I'm, I'm at a higher level. You challenging yourself to get people that, you know, I'm on a high level. I got this person. It's all, it's all just ones and zeros. It's all just, you know, chemical reactions in our brain. But I think it's still maybe as good a way of any to chart our path in life is how, how do I get out of my comfort zone? How do I live? The problem is, what we think in advance, what it's going to do for us is usually wrong. It's usually wrong. 
and and it, I think it goes back to like the Buddhist idea of attachment to outcome. What whatever we get attached to, whether it's wealth, having sex with a beautiful woman, having a great girlfriend, being married, having kids, making money, interviewing bigger and bigger names. Um, Buddha said it's just going to cause us to suffer. And we go, but, but wait a minute, but you know, but I want that. And so one story I tell is that when I bought this house down here in Mexico, you know, we've done a lot of things to fix it up over the last, you know, eight years or so. And we were landscaping in the front yard, front yard. We went to one of these monument places where they have concrete monuments, you know, pillars or ducks or, or you know, gnomes or stuff like that. And there was um, a, f a few Buddha, concrete Buddha monuments, you know, a little fat Buddha, happy little Buddha. And I remember seeing one of these Buddha. I want that in my front yard. And, and I, don't, I don't identify as Buddhist, but I like a lot of Buddhist teaching. And I grew up fundamental Christian. And um, I thought, I, I want that Buddha in my front yard. But, you know, I didn't know if I wanted to spend the money on it. And I knew it was heavy. I didn't have the vehicle to get it home. And so we went back a couple months later. I've been thinking about that Buddha. And finally, said, okay, I'm going to buy it. They said they could deliver it. They could put it in my yard. Had to wait a couple more weeks to get it. So I was so excited to get that Buddha. And finally, it came. I showed them where I wanted it. They put it it's right up in front of my house there. I stood back and looked at it. And I go, I'm not any happier today than I was yesterday. <laughs> and I thought, how profound that my wanting a Buddha statue <laughs> reminded me of the Buddha's teaching that it's all suffering. It's all suffering. Now, how do we transmit suffering into joy? Is we just notice where we're suffering, which shows us what we're attached to. And so if, for example, you got attached to having bigger and bigger names on your show, you're probably just going to suffer. If you get attached to, I want to get married and have a, have a wife and kids, you're probably going to suffer. Guys tell me that. And I go, well, you're going to suffer. And they go, because the wife's going to make me suffer. I said, yeah, she will. But that's not what I'm saying. Because uh, kids are going to make me suffer. I said, yeah, they will too. But that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> it is the attachment that I want things to go a specific way. And if they don't go that way, I, I'm not going to be sad. That's where the suffering comes in. How does that differ to having or wanting direction because i can imagine a secure and integrated man has direction and as a roadmap i have almost i actually have almost none almost none um and then we, that surprises people because robert people say robert you know you know the often say you know you're lucky you know you, you you have this purposeful life you're changing the world you're making a difference you live in a beautiful place you get paid for doing what you love and i usually say actually no luck involved you know to get a phd at 29 you know it's a lot of hard work but there was luck involved, you know, the scholarships I got, the, 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 the good places I landed, there were good places for me to go to school, you know, making the move to live in Mexico. That wasn't luck. Discovering it was luck and some doors open. But, you know, it's funny, the, the, the harder I worked, the luckier I got, <laughs> you know, write, writing a book that's making a difference in the world. You know, OK, there was some luck that my ex-wife said, if you don't go get help, I'm leaving you. And I happened to land in these places. And it, over time, I saw my nice guy patterns. But it took me six, seven years to write that book, three years to find a publisher for it. I've been promoting it now, 24 years later, I'm still talking to people around the world promoting the book. That's not luck. Now, but people say, but, you know, Robert, you've got a purpose. You're making a difference in the world. I am. And I agree. And, and, and I believe in that. And, I, and I'm happy about that. But you know what? I got up this morning, wrote in my, my morning pages in my journal. I got up and wrote this morning, go, I'm depressed. I said, it's not that I'm unhappy. It's not that I'm lonely. It's not that I'm afraid. It's not that, uh, I, uh, but I just had feelings of lethargy and just not feeling particularly happy. But I just wrote about it, right? I just watched it. I've written that before. I don't actually identify in general being a depressed person. I generalize, you know, I'm, I'm generally pretty happy and optimistic. But this morning, I just felt depressed. And I also knew that um, once I ate a little bit, once I meditated, once I uh, wrote in my journal, once I read a little bit, once I took the dog for a walk, once I, you know, got into, you know, doing things I love, doing interviews, I'll go into my gym in a little bit. Uh, um, once I have a little time to relax, I, I know that those feeling states will come and go, but they're also still telling me something to pay attention and, and to observe. So, I don't have this like 
ideal. Everything works out beautifully. Everything's perfect. Like I said, I almost died seven years ago. I had a tumor that almost killed me that nobody could figure out what was wrong. I was in pain for months. I lost over 30 pounds. I was fucking miserable. I knew I was dying, but I didn't know of what. Talk about existential angst. You know, I think we all know we're going to die. But when you actually are confronted with the fact I'm dying, my system, my body is shutting off. I am dying. I don't know what's killing me. And nobody else does either. Nobody knew. I went to a lot of doctors. Nobody could figure it out. And I thought, I don't know how long this is going to take to kill me, but I know it's killing me. And I knew I was getting close. I think I was actually pretty close. Luckily found a doctor at the right time that took care of it. So I'm not saying don't get up and chart your day and have a great day. And one of my sayings is I love waking up in the morning, not knowing how my day is going to end. Do I have shit on my calendar that needs done? Yeah, I do. Uh, did I schedule some of that yesterday, some of it weeks ago? Yeah, I do. And I can change it if I want. Uh, that's nice to know. And, and I don't know, I'm not, I'm not really taking this into a certain direction other than I believe I live purposefully and I don't really sit around thinking about what is my purpose. What I typically do is two things. If there's something I don't understand, I go towards it. So this morning, I didn't understand why I was feeling depressed. So I wrote about it. I just was curious about it. I just noticed it. And, uh, and I'm talking with you uh, about it. And I don't know what will come of that. Maybe it'll just come and go. I've felt it before. It comes and goes. Maybe I'll, I'll get some clarity about it. Maybe I'll, uh, out of that will come some things that I maybe need to be doing different, uh, eating different, sleeping different. Um, maybe I need more time in nature. Maybe I need more social connection. I don't know, but it got my attention to just pay attention to it. And so that's really kind of two, two things that kind of tend to drive my life. One is stuff I don't understand. That's why I write books. That's why I teach. I, I teach stuff I get curious about. And so I want to know more about it. And so I, I go into it. I think you're that way too. You know, um, I think you said your mother, I, I think I read that your mother passed away during COVID. That had an impact on you. And imagine that led you to try to understand certain things more. And now that probably shows up in how you do your podcast and your interviews. Now it shows up in your body and your feeling states. It's still there. Beautiful, right? Let that keep leading you. The other thing that leads me, besides wanting to understand things, is honoring what I call my sweet spots. When I came to Mexico, I remember the first my first day here, uh, I came from a climate maybe similar to you, Seattle's rainy, gray, cloudy, short days in the winter. Um, I came down here in Mexico and it was sunny and warm in October, sitting on a, a sidewalk cafe, two big margaritas for happy hours, some guacamole for five bucks. They're speaking Spanish around me. I'm, I'm a block from the beach, less than a block from the beach. Is what I'm going, I'm coming back. I'm going to work on my Spanish. It's a sweet spot. I honored that. So I do try to spend as much time as I can in my sweet spot. So I know if I get to bed by 9.30ish, once the stars sit in 10 o'clock, I'm, I'm getting out of the sweet. It's getting too late for me. Okay, it's a sweet spot. I can't always do it, but I try. If I get up between six and seven, it's a sweet spot. I'm alone in the morning. I've got my own time. I can meditate. I can write in my journal. Um, I like a cup of coffee with cream, but cream tends to give me allergies. So I don't do it so much. Even though it's a sweet spot, I don't get to go there quite as much. Taking my dog for a walk in the morning, usually with my wife, but since she's gone, it's just Nala and I. We did an extra lap just because we could. Um, so that's part of my sweet spot. If I don't take my dog for a walk in the morning, I miss it, right? So I've identified my sweet spots in the areas that aren't. Having a lot of things on my calendar during my day take me out of my sweet spots. I just realized doing them too early in the morning tend not to be what's best for me. I've learned to just honor all those things over time. So between going in the direction of things I don't understand that I'm curious about and just asking questions and trying to understand, that kind of leads me forward. And honoring my sweet spots seems to just keep moving me in directions where I say yes to what energizes and enlivens me. And I try to say no or, you know, not near as many yeses to things that don't. So, you know, I, I don't like... I don't like 
doing taxes or accounting. Not good at it, don't understand it, don't enjoy it. My sister's an accountant, good for her. My mother was a bookkeeper, good for them. I pay someone $550 a month to do all of my accounting and bookkeeping and record and taxes. Best $550 a month I spend on anything, right? Because it lets me stay in my sweet spot of not having to do that. Now, not everybody, no, we can't all do that. But I think if you work towards being able to, you know, honor those sweet spots and create an environment where you can follow your curiosity, for me, that works. I don't know if that works for anybody else, but I don't get up every day and say, what's my purpose? Uh, I, 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 I just kind of get up every day and do what I do purposely. I love that. I, I put up a, a picture on my Instagram today, Robert, of just this desk, which has a stack of books, a laptop, a camera, lighting, and a microphone. And I just said, some people understand it, some people don't, but this setup makes me incredibly happy. I think people should f uh, find more happiness with less. Uh, and honestly, as long as I can pay my bills, eat every day and do exactly this, I'm a happy man. Yeah, that's your sweet spot. And, and, sweet and, spot. I think, and I think it also lets you pursue your curiosity. So again, maybe that model works for you. I, I, I find it works for me. Again, I, I can't, you know, for, you know, like my desk here, I've got two 27 inch monitors right here, a sure microphone like yours, the, you know, the mic boom stand, the preamp, my phone here with the time on it, two cameras top of my computers, LED lights, you know, two different internet routers, uh, a powered USB hub, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, and, and of course to, to run it all is, is my, uh, Mac mini computer. Yeah. You know, I sit here and got, got Nala down here at my side. <laughs> I'm a happy man. Now, can I be happy without Nala at my side? Yeah. Was I happy before I got two monitors? Yeah. Was I happy before I had the Mac mini? Yeah. <laughs> Will I be happy if I don't have them afterwards? Yeah. And so, yeah, find the sweet spots. Just don't get too attached to them. When you were talking about leaning into the unknown and the uncomfortable questions and uncomfortable symptoms, do you have any big overarching questions nice guys should start to ask themselves? What do I want? What do I want? Because, uh, because you know, talk about doing interviews that stretch you. My second ever TV interview, it came about two days after my first ever TV interview. Uh, I, I've been doing promoting for No More Mr. Nice Guy before it ever got published and got some local media attention in Seattle. And then some of that blew up nationally. Uh, so uh, Fox News called a guy named Bill O'Reilly, who used to be a very prominent Fox News commentator until him being such an ass to everybody he met, finally got him fired uh, a few years ago. But he, he, he kind of drove Fox News. Um, 2020 contacted me, Today Show contacted me. I mean, it just really blew up. So my second ever interview I ever did television. I was sitting in a studio in Seattle and, and this is really cool. Cause you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I get these emails from the producer. We want you to, you know, we'll send a car to pick you up, to take you to the studio. The nice guy in me at first of all thought, no, that's not necessary. I can, I thought, fuck no, they can send a car. <laughs> so, you know, they send a limo for me. I, that, that was, that was, I'm not going to be a nice guy. They're offering me a car. I'm taking the car. The car picked me up. Drove me downtown Seattle to a television studio in Seattle. I go in this little booth that has a mural behind me of a fake view of downtown Seattle. And in this little dark booth, I'm in a chair. That's all that's in the room. And in the corner of this little booth is a camera up above me. That's it. And it has a light on it. When, when the light is on, I'm on camera. And I have to look at that. It's like I'm looking at the blue light on my El Delgado cam right here. I would look as if that camera is the only thing that exists. There's no monitor. I don't know what anybody else has seen, but you have to talk to the camera like that's a real person. Okay. So I'm, I'm Bill O'Reilly's interviewing me and I didn't even know who he was. Like I didn't know who Chris Williamson was before I went on his show. I, I, I did a little research, found out who Bill O'Reilly was. And um, so I don't think his producer prepped him at all as to why I was even on his show. And, and, and so, you know, I, Somehow we got off on this discussion of making our needs a priority. And, and he goes, well, what, what's that about? And I go, well, you know, 
nice guys have to learn to make their needs a priority. And he goes, no, that sounds like blasphemy. And what does that even mean? I said, well, okay. I said, Bill, this morning when you got up, you know, uh, who fed you? Well, I fed myself, of course. And I go, so you must have decided what you wanted to eat, either prepared it or had someone prepare it. You sat down, took the time, you ate, you put the food in your mouth. Yeah, what's your point? I go, that's you making your needs a priority. That's you <laughs> taking care of you. And he goes, he goes, Jesus is going to strike you dead. And he goes, that's just, you know, that's just the craziest. And I, and I just kind of like, I'm being with you, just kind of laughing, being playful, smiling, doing my best to, you know, teach him. And um, so anyway, that gets done. It's probably all of about three or four minutes long. Right. So talk, talk about, you know, the, be careful what you wish for the big interviews, you know, and, 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 you know, so I got down, shoot, I'm drenched with sweat, you know, I, but I survived it. A day later, my agent calls me and it says, he said, Barnes and Noble, who had already given me a contract for an ebook version of the book, but not a print one. Barnes and Noble loved the way you handled Bill O'Reilly and just thought, and they, they have full faith that you'll be able to promote this book and they want to give you a $35,000 advance. I was 25, 20 something years ago. And they're going to send you on a book tour and blah, blah, blah. And I go, ah, thank you, Bill O'Reilly for being such an ass. You know, so life's just interesting that way so to go back to your question about meeting our needs i tell nice guys because nice guys going back to those early belief systems as children we internalize the belief that we're bad for having needs because or maybe everybody else's needs are more important than our our own or their needs have to be met first so that they can meet our needs and often as little children we were actually trying to take care of the needs of our parents because we knew they weren't doing a good job of meeting their own needs. Therefore, their bucket wasn't full enough to take care of ours. We could sense that as children, right? My dog can sense when I'm not okay and come take care of me so that I'll be okay to take care of her, right? It's just in our nervous systems. So most nice guys grow up with this belief system around needs. I'm bad for having needs. I'm going to get in trouble if I have needs. People are going to be angry at me if I have needs. Other people's needs are more important. I have to give it to other people for my needs, all the stuff around needs. And we're terrible receivers, right? I've had so many people in my life say, Robert, you're difficult to give to. So enough, when enough people say something, you kind of got to, you know, entertain it might be accurate. I am. I'm difficult to give to. Uh, I, I can get up and do it myself. And so I've had to learn to let people give to me. I've had to learn to practice receiving. And the beauty is, I believe that as we learn to receive our bucket gets filled. Now, our inner bucket, however we want to look at it, whether we call that our self-esteem, our sense of self, our lovableness, just even, you know, our energy bucket that gives us the energy to get through a day. We got to take care of it. You know, I, 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 I got to take in a certain amount of calories every day to be okay. I have to get a certain amount of sleep to be okay. I have to have a certain amount of exercise to be okay. I have a certain amount of rest to be okay, a certain amount of social contact to be okay. All of those fill my bucket. I'm responsible for that. Nobody else on this planet is responsible. It was my mother and dad's job, but dad's dead. Mom's 89's had a stroke. So, you know, I, I have to hold her hand when we go for walks now, right? I got to take care of her. So I'm responsible for surrounding myself with people, with practices, with professionals who want to help fill my bucket as I help fill their bucket. That is that's essential for human existence but most nice guys think it makes them bad so that's that's a piece with most nice guys where i begin working with them usually around their honesty and their boundaries but also making their needs a priority putting themselves first filling their bucket and again just saying making yourself a priority and putting yourself first makes most nice guys kind of go like this you know like oh no bill o'reilly's gonna attack me if I do that. <laughs> so it's a big challenge for nice guys. You know, 30 years of working on this stuff, I, I still have to consciously let people do things for me. I'll get up from the table to go get a fork, and my wife will go, where are you going? I'll go, I'm going to the kitchen to get a fork. She goes, I'll go, I'll go. And I'm thinking, well, she already prepared the dinner. If I let her go, that'll make me an ass like my father that bossed my mother around. Mrs. Glover, get me a fork. You didn't get me a fork. You know, I don't want to be like that. So no. So I go, okay. I sit back down and I let her get me a fork 
Can I get up and get my own fucking fork? I can. Is it actually more loving to me and to her to let her serve me out of love? Yeah, but it's taken me a while to learn that. So yeah, when she wants to give to me, I have to practice saying yes. And it's taken a lot of practice over the years to let to say yes to letting people give to me because they want to. And it's just good practice for me to practice receiving. Do you think we're misconstrued with the social media TV narrative of what masculinity looks like, the protector, the provider? I, I, I see these archetypes for an emergent one being Andrew Tate, for example, who tells me that I need to be the man of the house and do all the provision of services. I think that archetype has maybe misconstrued my sense of self, uh, whereby I never ask for help. Um, I don't take favors when they're offered. If someone asks to cover the bill or pay for my coffee, I'll always say no uh, because yeah. of these online archetypes. Uh, well, you probably do that without the online archetypes. Um, so when you ask me a question, does social media and television, um, honestly, I'm not on social media and honestly, I don't watch television, but yes, so, I know what the archetypes are. So maybe the question is more so, do you, how would you describe masculinity and femininity? How would you describe masculinity and femininity when it comes to the provision of services? Okay. Provision of services. Okay. When I talk masculine, feminine, I'm not talking guy, girl, man, woman, I believe, and this is, this is purely a model that I'm going to give with you. And most models do nothing more than try to illustrate or explain the model can never represent the truth. Any, any religion is models. Buddhism is a model. Um, yogic approaches, Eastern thought are all models, uh, archetypes, they're models. You know, we might have, you know, archetypes, you know, from, you know, Odysseus or Adam and Eve, you know, they're, they're models. You read uh, Jordan Peterson's 12 rules for life. He takes a lot of biblical archetypes that represent a model. Trying to talk about God, the best you're ever going to do is come up with a model um, because God's ineffable, can't be described. So we like our models, but they also limit us because the words, words, and even images and pictures never can completely convey the depth of the thing. I mean, try to describe love. What does it feel like? To, you know, and, and if I got five people up here to describe love, they'd all give me a different description. Try to describe eating a banana. What does a banana taste like? Good luck. Good luck. It tastes kind of, well, no. <laughs> I can't think of anything it tastes like. Well, the texture is, well, no. It's yellow. How do you describe yellow? <laughs> so, um, you know, our, our models, we like them. They serve us. They also imprison us because um, we get tied to the models. And again, anything you watch on television, you know, even me talking about nice guy syndrome is a model. And, you know, I, I know because I've been working on my nice guy issues and I've worked with thousands of nice guys, that model can open the door for a lot of people to deeper understanding. A lot of people tell me, they write me, or I read, I've, I've read hundreds of thousands of self-help books. I read no more Mr. Nice Guy. Everything made sense. Okay. It's a model that worked for them. It helped them see how their own models weren't working very well. But you know what? They could then rigidly get caught up into the, I'm a nice guy model. For example, I, I used to go to 12-step to programs and there were people in there that just had turned 12 steps into a religion that had to be followed rigidly. And, you know, basically you're going to hell if you didn't follow <laughs> the big book. Exactly. You know, they, that was just their, you know, so what meant to set them free from the rigidness and the, and the toxicity of their addiction just got transferred into another rigid, toxic way of, of relating to the world. So models can be helpful, but we better not, you know, let them enslave us. You know, e even the Buddha's model of attachment to outcome is a cause of all suffering. It's a good model, but the, there's a book called, if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. Go, What's that about? 
Well, even Buddhism taught the, the, the model of Buddhism was like a raft across the river. That raft gets you across the river. And once you cross the river, you've crossed the river. You don't need to keep packing the raft with you anymore. And so Buddhism even teaches and then violates what they teach. You know, let go of the raft. You don't need it now. So that's why if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. Once you've met the Buddha, you no, no, no longer need the Buddha. Kill him, right? Once your archetype has set you free, given you the vision, helped you understand, get rid of it. It no longer serves you. And does the same fall the case for masculinity and femininity in that case? The model I'm about to give you is exactly that. That's why I gave you this little pre thing. I thought we were, I forgot we were talking about masculine and feminine. Thanks for reminding me. Like I said, you get older, memory fades. So you got to, don't, don't go, don't think you're going to be 80 watching a lot of memories. You know, <laughs> what was I going to do when I turned 80? I know I kept telling myself <laughs> that, but I can't remember what I said I was going to be doing when I turned 80. So masculine and feminine. A model kind of built around the yin yang model which is an old model, so an old archetype. You know, we've all seen the little emblem of, you know, black and white kind of half squiggle within the circle, a little off color, you know, black, white dot, I in each one, that yin and yang symbol. So what I have found is helpful for me in understanding myself, understanding men, understanding women, understanding relationship is a helpful model, but it's also a limiting model. And it's also one that doesn't explain everything and doesn't explain the same thing in every circumstance, right? But the way I look at it is I look at masculine and feminine as energy states. And again, most of this is borrowed from the, you know, the yin yang model, which is my own kind of little tweaks to it. The masculine in us, in you, in me, in my dog Nala, she got it moved behind me, in my wife, and in, you know, a woman I might meet on the street, the masculine in any of us, I describe as the doer. The masculine does because what it does what needs to be done and seeks to do it masterfully and be done doing it to rest in nothingness. If you go back to yin and yang, very deep Eastern thought, they say consciousness, they would not say, they say masculine is consciousness. They wouldn't say it does. It just rests in nothingness. It's completeness. Okay. In human form, we got to get some shit done. Ram, Ram Dass says, even after you attain, you still have to take out the trash. So, you know, we still got to get up. And like Bill O'Reilly, we got to make breakfast, right? <laughs> we got to take the dog for a walk. We got to take the trash out. So the model of my, my masculine model is a doing. And it seeks to do masterfully, to be done and rest in nothingness. And it is internally, uh, internally validated and energized, it's, it's energized by challenge and internally uh, uh, validated by job well done. That's the masculine in me, in you, and in any woman that you might meet, even in my female dog, that's the masculine. The feminine in us, in all of us, in me, in you, my dog, my wife, anybody that you might know, the feminine in us is everything that's not the masculine. It's everything that's not nailed down. It's the cosmos. It's everything that's moving, money, adventure, opportunity, uh, emptiness that wants to be filled. And the feminine in us as, as humans, just like this is not the pure yin yang as it's maybe described in Eastern thought, is the, the seeker and consumer of love, of experience, of fullness. It is the best way I know to put it. Some people kind of get, oh, oh, that's a terrible way to talk about women, but I'm not. It's about feminine. The feminine is an empty bucket with a hole in the bottom that needs to be filled externally. So the feminine in, and the feminine, by the way, in us is externally validated by, by love, by praise, by desire, by attention. The feminine in you wants to be noticed on social media. The masculine in you does not give a fuck. The masculine in you just does what needs to be done today because that's the thing today that needs to be done and could not give a fuck if anybody even noticed that you did it. But you would notice if you didn't do it well. You would. Your masculine wants to do it well, but doesn't give a fuck if anybody praises or does a happy dance or gives a like or subscribes. It does not give a fuck. And so we all have that masculine and feminine side and, and, and they can show up in different ways. It can show up in our, our, our uh, body state, our emotion state, our sexual state, 
and it may be different manifest different balances in different parts of our life most nice guys i found tend to have a fairly strong feminine side i do uh, I like to be loved. I like to be approved of. Uh, I like to be valued. I like attention. I like praise. All feminine. Those are all feminine things. And that masculine in me that everybody says, oh, Robert, you live with purpose. You do this. You do. I got that masculine. You know, I, I, I like getting shit done. Um, and I, I like doing the shit that I do. Um, and I like to get it done. And then, okay, nobody bugged me now. It's siesta time. I want my nap. I want to be left alone. I want I want my my rocking chair cinema. That's what you're saying. I'm going to live this masterful life and then be done. David Data says in the first paragraph of the way of the superior mind, a superior man, is the masculine error is to think at some point this will all be done. <laughs> it it doesn't. You, you do it and then you get up and have to do it again. So the, your your feminine is the seeker uh, of love the seeks connection, the flow of love. And, you know, for, I started sharing something with men cautiously about three, four years ago. I've been thinking it for a long time, but I finally shared it with one of my clients and he goes, Robert, that's fucking brilliant. And what it was, what I shared was, you know, culturally we think of feminine women as love, you know, love songs, love movie, you know, mother's love, but it, it, you know, I thought, but wait a minute, David Data teaches the feminines, the seeker of love and connection, and that seems to fit. I've talked about empty bucket. Well, if the feminine is a seeker of love, it can't be love. Why would it seek something that it was? And it dawned on me, well, that must, if we're going yin yang, you know, black, white, off. The masculine must be the source of love. And as soon as I let myself actually think it, I thought it actually connects all the dots that the masculine does love look up scott peck he wrote a book called the road less traveled it's a best-selling self-help book of all time there's nala barking at my guy working out in the front yard so he says that love is basically intention and action to act in one's own or another's best interest or spiritual growth so love is always an active conscious state it's not a passive uh oh i love you so much you know, that's not what it is. It's intention and action. Those are masculine terms. Those are masculine traits. And so when I started sharing with men that the masculine is love, the masculine is a source of love, men start going, fuck, it makes sense now. The feminine in me wants love, validation to be desired. And here's a problem we guys run into. We go to a feminine creature, you know, some woman out there that we think is attractive, we, we like her. And, and basically, we, we want her to love us. We want to be loved by her. And then they don't. And we go, why not? You know, am I not lovable? Well, we went to try to get an empty bucket, the seeker of love, to come love us. But yeah, she has a masculine side and she can't. My wife's very loving. You know, I'll, I'll be sitting here doing interviews and I'll look over and she snuck in my office and put a glass of coconut water right here on the edge of my desk. That's love. It's intention. It's action. When she gets up and gets a fork for me, it's love. It's intention. We may not call that love, but it's love. And she's in her masculine while doing it. So I have to then open my feminine to be receptive, to fill my empty bucket. She's one of, my wife is one of many resources I have in my life to fill my bucket. But that's my feminine that wants filled and will always be filled. The feminine lives in a state of demand and complaint and not enough. Because even as I'm feeling full, well, what you, that must be because my buck's being filled by a masculine source outside of me. It could go away at any time. And that's why, why the feminine is the seeker of love has more closed, you know, doors and walls up against love. Masculine is the, is, is the, the, the giver of love. So why, why would we be guarded? The masculine doesn't need to be guarded. It just gives love. It gives love. It gives love. It's its nature. I was speaking, um, and, and uh, a workshop down in Costa Rica had men and women at it. And I was talking about looking for love in all the wrong places. And I talked a little bit about this model. And I asked the men and women, in general, would you rather give love or receive love? Would you rather be the lover or the loved? And the women all go, oh, I want to be loved. I want to be loved. And then, then they start telling me, oh, and you know, I, I got this great guy in my life and he wants to love me, but I just don't let him. I don't let him close. I <laughs> my walls up, I have my defenses up. All the women go, yeah, me, me, I, I want love. 
And then they would tell me all the things they do to keep it from coming in because letting love in means you're vulnerable. Mm. You're, you're dependent. They can, if they give you the love, they can take away the love. Right? So the feminine in us lives in that state of fear and demand and complaint. Now later, none of the men really said much, but several came up to me later. Even a small group of them came up to me and said, Robert, we didn't speak up because there were women there and we didn't want to say the wrong thing in front of women. But they, they all looked at me and said, Robert, we'd rather give love. And I go, I know, I understand. The masculine in me loves giving love. And the feminine in me, which isn't real developed because I've been told don't be that way, is, is, is uncertain about receiving love, which as I've said, the, the feminine, even while I want love, but I don't trust you, or you might take it away, or you might not love me in the way I want to be loved, you know, or you once I open and let you love me, you're going to hurt me, which is true. We will get hurt. So my archetypes of masculine and feminine have to do more with, you know, the masculine is about purpose. It is about living life masterfully. It is putting a dent in the cosmos. And it doesn't need to be on social media to be seen doing it. Right? The feminine is all over social media. Look at me, notice me, another selfie, another this, you know, oh, look, uh, look at my likes, look at my subscribes, look at this, aren't I amazing? That's the feminine in all of us, right? And they're not, it isn't good, bad, going back to that yin and yang thing, they're equal, they're balanced, they're both necessary. And I think the more conscious we can be, going back to the model of this as an archetype, as a model, know that as a guy, as a guy, if, if you were a woman, if I was a woman, it doesn't, wouldn't matter. The more conscious we are, we can choose when our masculine side is most needed. We can choose when our feminine side is most needed. So on, on a call I did for my, my men's program, Integration Nation, uh, just a week ago, I had a guy named Warren Farrell who came on. He wrote a book called The Myth of Male Power many years ago, and he's written another, another book called The Boy Crisis. And, and so... Um, he was talking about a little bit about what you're asking about, about these masculine archetype of provide and protect. And he said, but, but, and so he brought up, he didn't say it the way I said it, but he brought up the, that provide protect archetype. And he brought up the kind of the, the nurture and connect archetype. Now I, I would call masculine and feminine. We have both, right? We have the desire to provide, protect do the masculine thing. We have the desire to, to nurture, to nest, to, to connect. That's the feminine side of ourselves. And he said, the problem that most men have, kind of going back to your question, is that at any given time, you know, the woman in our life may either want us to be that provider protector, you know, go, go, go earn as much or more than me so I can feel secure. Oh, and be here for me when I need you. Be the safe, secure father for the children I want to bring into the world. And so we men were kind of like we got these, both of these demands. Be the pride provider protector, you know, whether we go to red pill or Andrew Tate, all right, you got to be alpha. You got to be red pill. You have to have six pack abs. I mean, I see, I see the, you know, again, I, I don't watch a lot of interviews or podcasts. I do some, I'm starting to do more. Uh, I'm not on social media, but I know the memes out there for men. You got to be alpha. You got to have six pack abs. You better be in the gym regularly. <laughs> you know, you better, you better be buff. You better have, you know, this car, you better have this thing. You, you know, all of that provide protect mentality. Does that rob men? Yeah, it does. Does, does it really, I'm not even sure it's a, 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 a healthy motivator because if you go back to our true masculine, we don't need the six pack abs for, for the, the roar of the crowd. We don't need the nice car for the roar of the crowd, but we're basically being told you need it to get women, which if you think about it, that's actually feminine. <laughs> if we need something to attract that, that's the feminine part of ourselves. So that's one of the big mistakes that I think red pill and pickup make is that, you know, they teach you how to go approach this really hot, high quality woman to get her, you know, so she can be your girlfriend, you can have your ego. But as soon as you've done that, you're actually in the beta mode because you've made her the decider, but she's now the alpha. You're the beta. She's the masculine. You're the feminine. How's that going to work? <laughs> Not the way you thought it would. So, yeah, there's a lot of noise out there. My my best answer is I think when you understand what it feels like to be in your masculine or feminine, and, and I, I break that down to higher and lower. Higher's when you're conscious, 
of what's most needed from me. Well, I, I, I need to, I, at, at 10 o'clock today, I needed to be sitting at my desk ready to connect with you and talk masculine. I knew that's what was needed of me. I don't go, I'm not going to come get validation from you. I'm not going to get my needs met from you. We're just going to, you know, we're going to get some needs met. It's going to be a reciprocal interplay interaction. But when I get done with this, I'll, I'll, I'll go eat and relax. I'll, 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 you know, maybe get down on the floor with my dog. Uh, that's feminine because that's what I need now. I need to refill my bucket. My masculine has been working. My feminine's got, I got to fill the bucket up. Okay. But my masculine will husband my feminine. My masculine will say, okay, no more interviews, nothing on the calendar. Let's go relax. Uh, let's go close your eyes. Let's go eat a little bit. Let's go talk to a friend. Let's go, you know, love on the dog. Let's go send some messages to your wife, you know, on, on her vacation. I'll go fill my, the masculine will help fill my feminine bucket. Okay. So we need to know at any given time what's needed of us, what's required of us. And having those, that for me, that kind of archetype of masculine feminine, that model is helpful. Again, if we don't get rigid about it, well, you should be this, you should be that. Don't ever be this. Don't ever be that. No, kill the boot on the road. If it serves you, use it. If it's imprisoning you, it's time to let it go. Amazing insight into masculinity and femininity, Robert. I've not heard it be dispelled and deconstructed in such way. I'm going to clip that up as a trailer clip. of was insane. Thanks, mate. Yeah, post that on social media so I get a bunch of likes and then they can buy my book. <laughs> and then your, your femininity will be validated. <laughs> of course, of course. What advice do you have for young men in the dating market in the modern world? <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> You know, uh, I, you know, I, I, I have two books on dating. You know, when, when I, when I, I didn't start dating really until I was in my late forties after my second divorce and I got good at it and my, my clients, I was, I'm a therapist. So I had private practice and Robert, what are you doing? Teach us. I go, I'm not a dating coach. I'm not a dating guru. No, but you're having success. Teach us. <laughs> so, like I said, whenever I get curious about how does something work, I dive into it and then often we'll write a book about it. So I, I, I did. And, um, and I'm a big advocate of what I call being a social animal. Now, uh, honestly, the swipe right apps did not exist when I was dating. Um, they're a technological um, boon, you would think, to dating. And I think actually they, they've made it worse. Mm. They've made it worse. Um, social, you know, like I said, I've never been big on social media, never been. I remember years ago, 20 years ago, Robert, you need to be on Facebook. I don't want to fucking be on Facebook. You need to be. People can write on your wall. I don't want fucking people writing on my wall. I don't even know what that means. They, they, they don't still write on your wall on Facebook back then. You know, I didn't want to. Be, so somebody set me up my first Facebook account years ago and I never used it. And people, I'd get these little notices. Someone wrote something on your wall. I go, why? Why didn't they just call me or send me a, a you know, an email? Why'd they write on my Facebook wall? Whatever. <laughs> so I've never liked social media. I, and, you know, don't, don't get me going. I, I, think, I think social media is doing irreparable damage to culture and society. And I tell people, I'm not going to get on so, any social media owned by Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, or the Chinese government. So basically, I'll put shit on YouTube. That's about <laughs> it. So... Uh, and and true, that is my model. You know, think about it. Really, you want Mark Zuckerberg stealing your information? You want Elon Musk stealing it? You want the Chinese government stealing it? You pick. Google's still stealing my information as well, but I like YouTube. So, <laughs> you know, there's actually some good stuff on YouTube. So, uh, dating. <laughs> what do you do with the dating? Yeah, I'm coming back. I I, I, that one hadn't slipped my memory, but good job. Good job on the reminders. So, I, I, I was interviewing with a guy couple months ago, 19, 20 year old guy, real sharp guy. And, and he asked me the same question. What do you recommend for young guys in, in the days of social media? And I go, honestly, I don't know. I don't know. Cause here's the deal. Um, well, uh, let me talk. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about social media's effect. And I'll talk a little bit about the swipe, right? Apps. This, this guy gave an example, this young guy I was talking to. And he said, you know, as a girlfriend, and she had a birthday party and a bunch of people, I think they rented a hotel room or something. 
and, you know, they just had a party and you probably all got a little bit impaired. And, you know, he and his girlfriend, you know, fell asleep next to each other on the bed. I think they were probably fully clothed. And, you know, I don't know if during the night while they're in a state of impairment, maybe he touched her and, you know, a way that I guess you would touch your girlfriend, you know, and I think there were other people in the room and they're all crashed. And, and then like a day or two later, a friend, a, a female friend of his girlfriend, you know, I think that said, oh, she says you touched her inappropriately and she's going to put that on social media. And the, the, he said, the friend talked her out of doing it. And I'm going, he goes, what would you do? And I go, I don't know. I don't know what you do with that. You know, I don't know if you did anything wrong. I don't know if you did anything without consent. I don't know if there was anything that you, you know, should have not done and should never do. But the, the wild card here is what any given woman may want to put on social media. Um, on one of my, my, my brotherhood call yesterday, um, we had another guest on this one, Dr. Robert Masters, and he, um, some guys asked questions and he walked them through a process. Four different guys asked questions. They all cried. I thought, well, man, that's powerful stuff. That's better than Barbara Walters. <laughs> so, and there's one guy, he was really distraught because um, his girlfriend had broken up with him over something that she said was a breach of trust that he didn't know was at the time. And then he, he actually came on another call last night that I had, and he talked a little bit more about that. He, on the call, he said last night that when the girlfriend broke up with him over what she called a breach of trust, apparently he'd had a, a relation with another woman, but he thought they were open in their relationship. She put all of that, he told me last night, she put all that on social media. You know, so it just basically just, you know, went after his reputation. And, you know, so I don't know. I actually don't have a good answer. If I'm a young man and I like a young woman and, you know, we're getting to know each other and I teach men, set the tone and lead, you know, don't hold back. If you have an impulse, act on it. If you want to take her hand, take her hand. If you want to kiss her, give her a kiss. Now, I do talk about what I, I have, the pre-sex talk before clothes come off. Have a conversation. What does sex, what does us having sex together mean to you? That's a pretty good consensus question to ask. Um, talk about uh, uh, protection. How, how, if we're going to put penis and vagina, how are we going to protect ourselves? Talk about STDs or any sexual diseases and talk about unwanted pregnancies. Most guys go, I don't want to talk about all that stuff. I got her just drunk enough that she's taking her. No, 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 no. We're going to talk about that stuff because it's all important. And actually, it'll make for better sex. Because she's actually already worried about that shit anyway. Does she have a condom? Does she have an STD? Should I tell him I have an STD? You know, oh, I, you know, I, have, I, don't have, I haven't had my IUD or my, my pill. Or, you know, what if I get knocked up? They're thinking all that stuff. Talk about it, right? Now, because the feminine wants to feel good right now, I can't tell you how many women have said, oh, just put it in. You don't need a condom. I'm going, what the fuck? You know, you're the one that could get pregnant. You're the one's more likely to get an STD than me. I said, you're the one that bears all the risk. And you're the one going, oh, just put it in. Just put it in. That, that's the feminine. I want to feel good right now. I want to be filled right now. I want to be complete right now. And the, and the masculine's going, this is not a good idea. <laughs> Yeah, I don't want to wear the condom, but it's not a good idea for, 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 for many reasons. So going back to the social media thing, I don't know what to tell a young man other than only date women who aren't on social media. But good luck with that. You know, Generation Z, your generation, everybody's on social media. I don't know what to do because they can put whatever the fuck they want. You can even have complete consensual sexual contact. And next thing you know, she's telling everybody how shitty you are in bed and what a little penis you have because they can. So would I want to date in that environment? No. Nope. So I don't know that I have advice because I don't know what the answer is to that. Mm. Uh, Cause you can't tell someone don't put anything about us on social media because the feminine wants everything on social media. So I don't know. I don't think it's a good dating and sexual marketplace either. I don't think it's a good place to shop. Um, one thing that I did a couple of years ago, and it people don't believe me when I frame it this way, I, I went speed dating for the first time as a mm -hmm. self-development exercise, uh, sure. as a curiosity exercise as well. And people say, no, David, you just went to meet some girls. And even if that was the case, and so be it, um, that could have been 50% of the motivation behind it. Um, but I just wanted to... Because social media has become a place 
to uh, it has become a dating marketplace but a very um contrived and hallucinogenic marketplace it's not yeah, it, it doesn't refl- it. it doesn't reflect reality but speed dating is also a marketplace but it's not as hallucinogenic it's it's very real um yeah. the only uh, the only thing that may be contr- be contrived is the words that come out of the person's mouth they might not be called monica and they might not be from the west coast of scotland um but you can garner quite a lot of information about someone in real life in real time um and it's hard for them to maintain a a conversation that is contrived however they can maintain a conversation online that is contrived Uh, anyway Mm -hmm. I i went on the speed dating exercise and one thing i learned was how i present myself in these four minute rounds the way I introduce myself, the job title that I give myself, the way I ask questions, the amount of the conversation that I um, attribute to listening, all of these different factors, I got such an instant feedback loop in real time that I would never have got on social media through text messaging or through liking or commenting on posts. Um, I, I suddenly realized that my finance corporate nine to five job wasn't as interesting to talk about as my side hustles, which are podcasting and comedy. Uh, yeah. I realized that utilizing my skills in podcasting and listening a bit more and asking more questions was way more attractive than um, showing status and showing virtue and showing success. Um, I realized that how I might embody myself, the playful nature of myself, how that the variation in that and the intensity of that would be more attractive or less attractive based on how I present it. And they are all core skills that young men are not getting because they are solely searching. Because they're all on their phone and all the time. The, the, yeah, the singular domain is text. And you, yeah. can, you, can't, you can't convey how you smell or how you dance or your cheeky laugh. There's no embodiment in text messaging. Um, nope. But what, what we should be doing as young men or as young people, we should, be, we should be dating at speed dating. We should be going to salsa classes or bachata classes. We should be doing... Um, yoga or more embodiment exercises where both uh, vocab and appearance and movement um, all form part of the package not just text yeah. messages online I, followed by a contrived photo i agree 100 percent. and you know and that's what what i teach in in my dating essentials for men you know books is that become a social animal i i i did about 200 podcasts on just answering dating questions that, that are on my website and at the end of every one, I'd say, get out of the house, expand your route, talk to people in public, test for interest, walk through open doors. And COVID came along and kind of made a lot of that more difficult, but we can, we can do it again. There's nothing like, I call it, you know, guys would come to me and, and they say, well, okay, I want to learn how to date. I want to get a girlfriend. I want to get laid. Okay. I go, what we're actually going to do though is work on your social and emotional intelligence. We're going to expand both your social and emotional intelligence. I go, oh, no, I want—I just want a girlfriend. I want to get laid. I go, I know. I said, that's why I don't call this expanding your social and emotional intelligence. We're calling this how to date because you're, we're going to use your desire to date to do expand your social and emotional intelligence. You can only really do that around people in person to where you get, like you say, those instant feedback loops of how am I coming across? You know, oh, this seems to be, you know, this seems to work. This seems to not work. And not that I'm saying go read and be a chameleon and figure, you know, everything out. Just practice your social skills. Talk to everybody. Don't wait till you see a pretty woman and go, what what pickup line do I need? What hypnosis? What NLP? What you know, what, <laughs> what do I do to get her to, you know, what what feather do I need to put in my hat? Or, you know, what whatever it is I need to do. And so I teach men how to just test for interest. It's the basis of all social interaction. So my thoughts are, are about the social media and the swipe rights. We, we, we live in, for lack of a better term, maybe it's a good term, in what I'll call hookup culture. Mm. The people are all just about hooking up. Let's just, you know, you know, just, just meet up, have sex as we can, and then, you know, move on. And the swipe right apps make it easy. Just, you know, hook up. Who's, who's right around the corner from you? Who's there? Who's there? And, you know, men and women are using it. And, you know, men can go to all these dating, you know, pick up boot camps and get all the skills. And women are putting all their selfies on TikTok and Instagram. And look at me, I'm sexy in my underwear, blah, blah, blah. And and you'd think that, you think that everybody would have a boyfriend or a girlfriend and or at least sex partners. But statistically, 
you know, some studies I saw in the U.S. in the last few years. For the first time in history since they started tracking numbers, men and women 35 and under in the U.S., over 50% of men and women under 35 answering questionnaires indicated they had not been in a relationship in the last year, over 50%. Did not have a boyfriend or girlfriend in the last year. And another survey I saw was more about men, like maybe 25 and younger. I'm probably getting some of the numbers wrong, but it's the general message about both these, these surveys. I need to go back and look at them again. The one about men, like 25 and under, something like over 50% reported not having had sex in the last year. Well, if there's anybody that Mother Nature wants having sex, it's, it's 18-year-olds. Right? It's not 68-year-olds, I promise you. My DNA is fractured and it sucks. You know, Mother Nature does not want me impregnating young women. It does want 18-year-olds doing it. Right? That's just how, how the, this house built. Right? And these guys aren't having sex. Now, I, I have no doubt they're jerking off endlessly to the endless amount of porn that they can look at. So here's what I think is happening. Here's my, just my theory about it. Is that as a young guy, you know, you've grown up with media in front of you your entire life. You, 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 you probably had a phone in your hand at three days old. You've probably been looking at porn, you know, since you were, you were you know, an infant because it was there. You could see it right there on your phone, right? You know, probably had social media since, you know, you knew of social media. You know, you probably hack things on your phone. You probably know how to steal stuff on the, you know, steal videos. What You probably didn't know all that shit because you grew up with it. So that's your life. That's what you know how to connect with is, is this. You don't know how to connect with real people. So you're right. We need to get out around real people. But here's, I think, the thing that why I think the technology is hurting us is that if you've seen tens of thousands of beautiful women in your lifetime, in all stages of nakedness. Hell, if you just go to the local mall and watch all the women from 15 to 35 to 55 walking around in their Lululemon, you're seeing women in you know, basic stages of undress that that's what the street, you know, street walkers used to wear to get men's attention you know, for prostitutes. Now it's called Lululemon. And I love Lululemon, don't get me wrong. My wife wears it, right? But what I'm saying is, you know, you're... Our grandfathers, maybe your great grandfather, maybe saw three beautiful women in his lifetime and didn't see any of them naked. You and I have seen thousands of beautiful young women, many of them naked. Okay. So I give you an app that gives you access to thousands of young, attractive women in various states of clothing and non clothing and say, pick one, just one, pick one. And uh, she'll be your girlfriend and you'll have regular sex with her. You know, they've all agreed. Thousands of them. They'll 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 pick one, but just one. You know, well, but I like that one. And I like that one. Now, if I can only pick one and yeah, yeah, I'll have a girlfriend. Yeah, I'll have sex. But, but, but what if I then see that one and she is younger and sexier or more attractive or I didn't see her before? You, you won't pick one. You won't pick one because you're always going. It's a fear of missing out. But there's a whole lot of them out there. What if I pick that one and she's not as good as that one? Or I haven't seen a real, the better one that's going to walk across my view in 15 minutes. That fear of missing out is you won't pick one because you, you have so many that you can just keep scrolling with the idea of that, oh, yeah, it'd be nice to have one or it'd be nice to have three or five or 12 or all of them. So you don't pick one. So you don't get any. Have you, have you came across uh, a lady called Logan Yuri? for does not ring a bell so she is the director of relationship science at the app hinge but she also okay. is a new york times bestseller of the book how not to die alone and she writes about and it may not be her original idea but she has these three dating tendencies one is the uh, maximizer one is the romanticizer one is the hesitator um okay. I, 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 the romanticizer um fascinates with um the environment when there needs to be sparks um, it needs to be a really situationally perfect relationship before I enter it. The hesitator is more so um, intrinsic, whereby a person needs to do a lot of self-work before they feel worthy of love. Uh, I'll only I get a girlfriend once I graduate or once I have a stable career or a house. The list goes on. But the one that I believe is in most prevalence 
is the maximizer. And that is the case that you described there, whereby people think, I will not settle with Sheena because Trace, there might be a Tracy um, down, down the line um, and they are almost on a romantic hedonic treadmill. Uh, yeah. And I can believe That's a good term, romantic hedonic treadmill, because you know there will always be a better one that you haven't seen yet. And then if you're with one, well, I can't be with that other one because I picked one, so I better not pick this one because I know there's a better one coming. And I, I don't think Tinder and these other apps are, in fact, dating tools. I think they're nothing but benchmarking technologies. I think both men and women use them to understand their level of attractiveness and then swipe accordingly to that best standard to see if they can get someone even bigger and better and then set the new standard. Kind of like you do getting people on your show. You know, <laughs> you know, I, I, I got Dr. Glover on. I know I can get even bigger and better now. Cause I, and, and so, so yeah, the thing with women on, on, with these technologies, it's a, it's kind of, it's a little bit like the men, but different. Okay. And, and that is, Give me a second. I'm going to let Nala be right back and I'll talk about women. No. Anyway, there's, there's just probably somebody outside the house. There, There is. I have no idea who it is, but anyway. Okay. Women. We'll make the cut. No, women. Um, they're on the apps too. And, you know, the, the feminine, as we're talking about, is validated by attention, desire, attraction. So, you know, okay, you're paying attention to me. I feel validated. I'm a, so let's say a woman on the app, you know, m moderately good looking or maybe even just moderately young is getting thousands of, of likes, swipes, whatever a day. You know, they're they're hot and young. They're just bombarded with this. And I'm going to tell this woman, OK, you know, there's a lot of great men out there. A lot of them want to get with you and uh, pick one. You're going to have a great, you know, good looking, great Got boyfriend, you're going to have sexual access. You're going to have status because you have a boyfriend, but just pick one. Oh, and you mean then I can't stay on the apps and keep getting that constant attention from all the other. No, no, no. You have to get off the app. You have a boyfriend. That's why you're on the app to find the boy. Oh, but I kind of like having all these men pay constant attention to me. I don't want to just pick one and have to give up all that. So I think we've got these apps that give men access to a lot of you know, attractive, available, perhaps, you know, young women and give women, you know, access to all these men who think they're great and want to pay attention to them and want to spend money on them and take them places and get them naked, of course. And when, but if you have to just pick one and stick with one, everybody's got that fear of missing out. I'll lose, I'll lose by choosing. So they don't. And so, Nobody has a girlfriend, boyfriend. Nobody's getting laid. And we're going, but we have the technology to do it. So that's what I say. Put the technology down. Get the fuck out of the house and just start being a social animal. And have some interesting life experiences. Have some good stories to tell because that's who wins, right? Two, One of the most stories wins. Two, right. There's actually a really fascinating study on this. I can, I'll need to find it for you. But it showcases the OnlyFans kind of adult um creator uh, industry and it looks at the increase of age of uh, self-employed uh, pornography stars it shows you the inclination of age um, but the declination of fees that they charge and then the inclination of profanity that they show on the platform so basically the, hypo the, the, the conclusion is as porn stars on these apps get older they charge less and show more therefore to receive equal if not more levels of validation because of as they age they become quote unquote less sexy to the the widespread market therefore yeah. to recharge that level of validation they need to either give a greater discount or show more skin or do more prolific acts yeah uh, you know and that's gonna happen to, that's gonna happen to you on your podcast at some I, point you're gonna have to settle and get lesser and lesser people to come on your show for you. And, you know, you're going to have to, you're going to have, you know, more dumbed down conversations. It's just going to happen, you know, but you'll, you'll have those memories, you know, for you when you're 80, you know, it, this, I even just laugh, even we, you know, calling dating the marketplace, you know, but you see that a lot, you know, a, a guy I know, uh, um, Dr. Uh, Ryan um, uh, Taraban, 
he just published a book. He's going to come on my program. He's interviewed me. He does Psychax, you know, a pretty popular podcast. And his book talks about keeping your value basically in the dating marketplace. I go, it's a fucking marketplace, right? It's a meat market. Well, I guess we've heard that. <laughs> but um, it, so it's funny how we even look at it. This isn't even just called like, I want to learn to date because I'd like to have a girlfriend. We don't even call it that anymore. No, it's a marketplace. You've got this value. You're, I mean, Red Pill talks about the high value man, high value woman. We've got all these things you got to check off. Blah, blah, blah. Just do you like the person? Do you like hanging out with them? You know, well, I wonder why we treat it such as such. Is it because there's some sort of e economics that underpin it? We now, because of social media, we understand we have 1,700 followers. Therefore, we might have a 10% conversion of that 10%. 10% of that 10% are high value, 90% are low value. We start treating it like a stock market, perhaps. Maybe maybe it's the the quantification I think, I think, of everything. I think it all happens because naive and ignorant young men will buy anything if, <laughs> they, think so, if they think it'll get them laid. So if we can present a model that will go, this is going to get you instantly laid by young, hot women, um, guys will buy it. Uh, it's, just, it's, it's how the internet works. You know, if it wasn't for young men spending, well, yeah, old men too, spending money on the internet, the internet would not exist. And of course, most of where the money goes is porn. I think That's so. reality. So, Robert, to end on one final question, what is, what are, sorry, what is the best remedy for recovering in these guys? Don't do it alone. Yeah, that's the number one thing I always say is I say that no more, Mr. Nice Guy. Men want to figure shit out on their own and then go do it because we don't like being vulnerable. We don't like looking like we don't know what we're doing. Um, our shame takes over. We think we should know everything. We should be good at it. That's why, again, why we like being on the Internet. We can go watch hundreds of thousands of videos all on the same subject. Uh, right now, I've started to research DIM, D-I-M. It's, it's a supplement comes from cruciferous vegetables that can help lower bad estrogen in your system. So all of a sudden now I'm binging on dim videos, right? And you know, guys do that on every area of life. We just go binge on information and videos because we think if we can just learn. And I, I tell guys all the time, quit reading books, quit going to self-help seminars, quit watching YouTube videos. You probably have enough information already to change your life in significant ways. But it's easier to go keep consuming information rather than just go act on the information you've been consuming. Acting on the information is scary. It means being vulnerable. It means probably not getting it right the first time. It might mean looking foolish, looking stupid, having to ask questions. Guys hate that. That's why trying to recover from nice guy syndrome. You didn't become a nice guy in social isolation. You won't recover from being a nice guy in social isolation. I'm going to have to, the, I, I know what's going on outside. Uh, my attorney came wanting some money and my son's outside the window gesturing at me. So let me wrap the piece up and I do have to go take care of some business. So don't go it alone. Find a tribe, get in a men's group. Get in a men's program, Integration Nation. I launched it just to give men all over the world a place to connect with other men. Get a coach, get a therapist, go to 12-step. Do something to connect you with other men. Don't do it alone. So that's that's my number one piece of advice for men who want to break free from nice guy syndrome. Dr. Robert Glover, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much for coming on the show. David, it's been a blast. You do a great job. I'd be glad to come back again. Let's do it again. All right. Thank you.